Jessica and Fenner go Broadway, Maccabi are reeling, and we look ahead to what's in store in the next round of Euroleague, all on Sweet 16. Tune in. Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of Sweet 16, an open look on Euroleague basketball. I'm Moshe from Team Scout, and as always, my great co-hosts with me, say hello to Emmett and Aris. Hi, Emmett. Hi, Moshe. I'm here at Ball in Europe headquarters, a.k.a. my bedroom again. And as you can tell, I've been up a long time for this show. And hello from Athens, where uh, it could be snowing soon, so we, will have, uh, we didn't have wet Christmas, but we will have at least a wet uh, turn of the year. I'm sure that Emmett and Aris will agree with me. We've got a great show this week, as always. But first, you know, happy holidays for everyone. Uh, it's been a great few uh, last days as we're approaching the next game day of the EuroLeague, which will pretty much be the halfway mark of the regular season. Emmett, please tell us what we have in store for this week's show. Well, most are obviously going to lead off in the four-minute warning with a look back at that absolute epic between Cheska and Fenner, where Fenner got overtime revenge. Coach's playbook it kind of has to go only one place, and that's uh, the Maccabi situation. We'll have a few other bits as well, but no question that Maccabi are throwing away leads right now in games they need to win has got to be a concern. And the scouts notebook, we're going to look at a few players you expect to hear about, and one or two underappreciated ones who need a bit more love, like Marcus Imanovic. And of course, then we're going to look ahead to uh, this week's big games, which uh, all promise to be absolute crackers. Four minutes to get through all the action that just happened in Euroleague. It's the four minute warning. Well, it is the holidays, so while it's a four minute warning, we might be close to the 14 minute warning this week. So let's start our past week review with uh, the game of uh, Panathinaikos against uh, Basconia. The Greens uh, were needed that uh, win. And uh, they finally got it, but it was not easy. The, end, uh, uh, the last uh, play belonged to the guest, and uh, Roderick Bobois took it uh, to himself to get uh, the winning basket. He couldn't, but uh, the point is that uh, Panathinaikos uh, is back and uh, thinks only can get better with uh, Alessandro Gentile getting uh, in the rotation of the team. Uh, there's still a question mark about uh, the Greens and uh, how what they can do if uh, Nick Kalathis doesn't get uh, uh, some playmaking uh, help. Uh, in the first game of the Greek League uh, with uh, Gentile, the Italian tried uh, and uh, did create for uh, his uh, teammates. Uh, we will see how this can translate to the Euroleague. But to get back uh, to the Basconia game, it was a very crucial game for Panathinaikos because uh, after this win, uh, they are now uh, a part of the tie in the second spot uh, alongside uh, Basconia, Pan Olympiacos uh, and uh, Real Madrid uh, and of course Fenerbahce. So things are, uh, have really changed in Panathinaikos camp after the addition of coach Pascual. It was uh, a typical game between uh, Panathinaikos and Basconia. Uh, very hard-nosed uh, defense from uh, both sides, uh, many big plays down the stretch. Uh, we talk about uh, Bobois taking uh, the last shot. Uh, I didn't uh, talk about Kalathis playing uh, phenomenal defense against him. Kalathis is emerging, uh, if not the hair of the Dimitris Diamantidis, uh, then he's uh, without a doubt uh, the leader of uh, this Panathinaikos team. And uh, on the other hand, Basconia has uh, to figure out what's going on with uh, Andrea Bargnani. Uh, they need Bargnani and Bargnani has uh, uh, more than his share of uh, injury woes. Of course, uh, in recent years, this is not exactly news for Bargnani, but uh, Basconia doesn't have the luxury to constantly missing one of the key players in the paint. Uh, having said that, uh, Basconia, even without Bargnani, remains one of the top teams in Euroleague. They had uh, veteran help in the face of uh, Pablo Prigioni, who can uh, still give quality minutes. And uh, uh, that's why it's even more of a shame uh, for Bargnani to be missing. He traveled to Athens, but uh, due to illness, he couldn't compete uh, now. He's also questionable this week, and uh, without him, I don't know what uh, can be the ceiling of uh, Basconia. It was proven at this uh, exact game that uh, if uh, Bargnani and his offense were uh, present at Oaka, maybe 
the Spaniards will have a better chance for a road win. On the other hand, Spain speaking about road wins, we have Olympiacos visiting Bruce Bamberg. It seems strange, but Olympiacos have lost four games on the road against Bamberg in the five matchups between the two teams, and this time. That this was kind of too easy for the German champs to uh, get the win, uh, getting a huge lead uh, from the get-go, and uh, Olympiacos trying to get back in the game. But uh, in the end, uh, Kulden uh, uh, be as competitive as uh, they wanted. There is a whole conspiracy scenario about uh, uh, Bros Bamberg uh, uh, letting go the game against Real Madrid in order to focus on the game uh, against Olympiacos because uh, it was uh, uh, a week with two games for every team and that's why the Germans uh, didn't put up a fight against Madrid. I personally don't buy it but uh, I believe that uh, what was said for the other side that Olympiacos was uh, kind of uh, tired after uh, playing two weeks, uh, two games in the same week and uh, beating uh, Tsverna Zvezda uh, can hold some true to it and uh, also it was obvious all in that game considering also how Meli played that uh, missing Jorgos Prindes is, uh, is a huge issue for the Reds. Uh, Prindes is not only part of the heart and soul of the team. He's uh, the only player, one of the very few in the Euroleague and that's why he's uh, uh, a hot name right now. He's one of the few uh, true post players left in Europe. He can uh, create from himself, he can uh, play with his back uh, on the basket, which seems to be a lost art for many of the big men uh, who are uh, uh, part of the Euroleague and uh, without him, without a focal uh, point uh, on the offense, Olympiacos had huge issues uh, trying to score. And uh, of course, uh, Kostrin Kerry, who is one of the brightest uh, technicians in the league, uh, uh, took uh, every possible advantage from this situation, uh, giving to Olympiacos the outside shot. And uh, when uh, the outside shot was not falling, uh, Predesis was not there to give. Uh, a different uh, offensive approach to the team uh, that created uh, uh, the context the, in which uh, Bruce Bamberg got uh, with a relative, uh, relative ease a uh, key win for them because uh, 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 let's face it Bruce, ba uh, Bruce Bamberg is not uh, that bad of a team as the record suggests uh, they currently are uh, trying to get back in the playoffs race, but uh, they have lost too many games on details, too many games on the last shots. And uh, I believe that uh, in the second round uh, they will not uh, give up and they will try their best to get uh, to the playoffs. And uh, the bad thing for uh, every other uh, Euroleague team is that uh, they have the tools to do it. They can, they are able <laughs> to get it uh, done. And uh, if uh, they are a little bit uh, more lucky, if uh, they are a little bit uh, more uh, focused on how to close the games, I think that uh, uh, playoffs are. Uh, uh, a feasible goal for them. Uh, they, they should try and uh, get in and I believe that they can. Uh, and one interesting uh, side story of the game is that uh, many believe that uh, Olympiacos will try and get Nico Zissis from uh, Bros uh, Bamberg in order to replace the injured uh, Daniel Hackett and uh, why in, uh, why would the Olympiacos do that? Uh, for many years, uh, this is, is considered to be one of the targets of the team in the off-season. <laughs> but, of course, uh, Bros Bamberg uh, will never give uh, their key point guard just uh, to help Olympiacos uh, uh, 
get uh, at least in the final four because uh, this has the quality to replace uh, Hackett. More of that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the rest of the show, when we will talk about uh, Dominic Waiters, the new addition in Olympiacos roster. So that was, you know, all about Zizis and him being a necessity to, to pretty much every team. But, you know, speaking of especially Maccabi, what happened to them on, on Friday versus Dachka uh, playing actually in Turkey at the Volkswagen Arena. You know, they were up again in the double digit uh, uh, lead, but they've lost yet another game in, in what proved to be uh, way too crucial. Or maybe, you know, Victor Rudd's uh, three pointer just before the buzzer sound. Uh, might actually, you know, uh, give them some sort of uh, encouraging spirit in, in case that, you know, uh, they will match up against them in a fight over a playoff spot. Uh, but we will discuss more, uh, um, you know, and I will elaborate more on the situation with Maccabi uh, in our next parts of the show. Uh, I mean, you know, I've seen the um, Zvezda Madrid game. I got to admit, Zvezda are now looking like uh, a team that might be fighting for uh, another playoff spot second year in a row and it's something that I've written down on the ranking games you know they are uh, they had to come with a, um, some sort of a mentality to be able to uh, uh, to be in the situation where they currently at and seeing them I think maybe uh, back-to-back years in the playoff would be a huge success for them uh, also beating on uh, you know beating Real Madrid was not something to overlook I guess yeah, absolutely. Like, I think I'm the most popular man in Belgrade right now because I had Zvezda down as 15th of 16th going into this season. And I've been quite happy to say how wrong I was, I think, uh, repeatedly so far this season because they're playing great basketball. Like, they know their limits, but they also know how to work within them. We we're going to talk a bit more about Marcus Simonovic and what he does for them in a while. But yeah, like Zvezda, they're getting W's you don't expect them to get. And they're, like, you know, just beautifully organized as in they know what's necessary and where they can get wins where the average punter mightn't see them getting that W out there. Speaking of uh, taking a W where the average punter didn't quite see it, Fenerbahce going to Seska Moscow there last week and getting the win, that wasn't a huge surprise but the manner in which they did, a little bit surprising because uh, Seska got off to a really hot start, 10 point lead after one quarter, you're thinking right, Fener aren't quite all there, they've had a rough week as it is having uh, lost their previous game that week. And then, of course, they come back, they get it all tied up, goes to overtime, and we're all thinking Berlin again. And basically, a bit of hero ball from Bobby Dixon and a whole lot of uh, just, you know, beef from Ekpeudo. And yeah, that was that. Was that. Like, Fenner absolutely dominated Sheska in overtime. That was actually, in many respects, a repeat of Berlin, only with, in that case, of course, it was Sheska doing it dominating. I don't see this game as being that important long term to the overall standings and all that that's just not the case but i think psychologically for fenner being able to win a game like this on the road even if sheska were without nando de colo who's obviously an extraordinary talent last year's mvp uh it's a case of just getting that w getting that win against sheska i think psychologically after a tough couple of weeks it's got to be said for fenner i think that's huge for them it's huge for them and also you know we've got to mention that three teams out of the out of our uh, four minute warning they were missing key players. Olympiacos were without Printezis, and you know, uh, pa- um, Basconia were without Barniani, uh, basically from the beginning of the season, as his coach stated somewhere. Um, but I think maybe uh, the lack of, of Nando De Colo versus Fener was also uh, very substantial in a, in a game that his final uh, uh, results uh, suggest that it was a sweet game, at least with 16. Absolutely. They went Broadway, great overtime classic. Uh, definitely one worth a rewatch if you've got free time between now and well the start of the next round. From when you tune in to the start of the round, it's w- worth a look. It's just a bit of you know playback, watch the game, guys. And also speaking about people missing, don't forget Bogdan Bogdanovic from Fenerbahce. Oh, of course. But yeah, that's that's pretty much our look back at the week. So you know what's next. If you had an open look, one shot, would you swish it, wish it, or go fish it? Sixteen teams. Gonna be sweet. Sweet 16. The coach's playbook, where we look at the strategies that worked and that need to work in the coming weeks in EuroLeague. And naturally, the uh, matchup from the last round we want to look at here in the coach's playbook, for me at least, is uh, Obradovic and Etudis. Well, round two, I suppose, if you're counting Berlin as round one. Of course, they had a couple of meetings 
uh, you know, around that ever since and beforehand. They've, they know each other so well over the years. But this is the one where you kind of got to see of, you know, yep, the master can still beat the apprentice when he absolutely has to. It wasn't the course of these stakes that were in Berlin. No one's arguing that. But I think crucially for Bradovich, he did something which he hasn't done too often with Fenner this season. That is, show a capacity to come back from behind. Because, as we've mentioned, Bogdan Bogdanovich is still out for Fenner. Their backcourt's a bit thin. You're seeing Pero Antic getting older. It basically isn't playing with a team that had the smoothness of, say, playoff era Fenner last year. Obradovich, however, is still finding a way to get everything together, just get, a, get the most out of the assets he has, which until Bogdanovich is back is pretty much all he can do. And right now, I think that's working out okay for them. Last week, we've mentioned that should Maccabi be uh, up again by uh, um, a double digit, so substantial uh, margin versus their opponents, it's going to make them, you know, it's going to bring them much closer to a W, and we couldn't have been more wrong. Basically, again, Maccabi showed that their mental toughness still needs a lot of work, giving Coach Bogatskis another uh, possible headache, uh, which uh, will, you know, it might be a positive one uh, when we're going to discuss the scouts' notebook with uh, players coming back in. But you know, for Maccabi, it was a huge test for them. Uh, they showed again they have the talent, but right now, what they need to do is show, alongside with the coach, that they have the mentality to kill the game. And with Dachka, to be honest, I gotta admit, they've signed Ante Zizic. I love that signing. I think he can contribute, especially in the five position, which is lacking. And, you know, we'll see how uh, it goes in the next upcoming games. Olympiacos needed a player in order to replace uh, injured uh, Daniel Hackett, who is out of the season. Dominic Waters was the man for the job. Uh, Olympiacos took him from... Uh, uh, Cantu, he started the season at Tennessee, but he was cut in the medical exams. Uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, this was not the issue because uh, he ended uh, the season uh, with Aris and an injury, a knee injury, but uh, the doctors that did the exams at Tennessee probably didn't uh, do quite uh, uh, the job uh, that was needed. Uh, Walters, uh, turned out to be a steal for Cantu, he was, average, uh, he was averaging 14 points and uh, 7.5 assists in Lega Basket. I don't know how this number will translate to Euroleague, but uh, considering the fact that Olympiacos was one guard short, uh, Waters was uh, a very different player, a completely different player that Hackett can bring them uh, some uh, a good shooting uh, from uh, mid-range and also some creation that can help uh, Vasil Spanoulis on the, uh, that uh, department. Uh, how he will uh, adapt and uh, how he will uh, help uh, the Reds, uh, that remains to be seen uh, on the court. And now it's time for the Scouts Notebook, where we look back at key performances during the week in EuroLeague to see who stood out and why. When pa Kostas Papanikolaou was added, uh, last season in uh, Olympiacos roster, it was obvious that uh, that was a move also for the future. Uh, he's one of the top uh, great players and uh, local players in every Euroleague team can be the key in order to get you to the end. Uh, and that's also the issue for many other teams, uh, many, many other non-Greek teams, especially like uh, the Turkish one. But that's another story. Our story and our focus is Kostas Papanikolaou who after his NBA experience seemed to be out of sync when he returned to Europe. I believe that uh, at this point of the season he's starting to find his uh, real self. His energy is there, his motor is there. The problem was his uh, uh, offense. He was not consistent, he was not knocking down the long-range shots and that was an issue also for him in the NBA. But uh, especially during his uh, years in uh, Barcelona, he was quite a force, not only in transition, not only in the open court where he's obviously one of the most athletic forwards uh, around Europe, but uh, also making the shots when it mattered. Uh, he did make some big shots also during his years of Olympic uh, course, but now it's the time to do it again and hopefully for the Reds, he's uh, back on track. The Dutch Maccabi game gave us a, a couple of things to look at. One was um, not as good, the other was very good. Uh, we're talking about the perimeter game of Maccabi Tel Aviv, uh, whether it's on the offensive end, which is kind of solid. Uh, though we would love to see a guy like Goodalak uh, getting more points, and that is something that Coach Bagatskis would have to figure out how to do exactly that. On the same note, with talking about perimeter lockdown, and you know, we just had to say, good luck 
down uh, for us anyway. Um, Maccabi's defense on the perimeter end is not that good. It's another headache for uh, Coach Bagatskis, which has now gotten at least some good news with Quincy Miller coming back to play. I know that for a fact Mike Serbs is ecstatic about it. You know, he just loved, uh, uh, you know, uh, Quincy Miller in Belgrade and just having him back right now. For him, it's a sight for his sore eyes because he missed him. He missed him bad. And now he's getting him, you know, Maccabi's finally getting another uh, uh, power forward who can do what they need him to do. And that is great for them. You know, they built pretty much the team around him. Uh, that's what they uh, aimed for and now they are getting him after five months of absence due to injury All the reasons to be just happy and we're gonna have a quick look this week at Marko Simonovic of Kravena Zvezda More because he's doing well as so the right thing in both ways on the stat sheet and in terms of the on-court Inspiration slash veteran presence. He's put the numbers up there had a great night of course there against Real Madrid But you sort of you come to expect him to have good nights. Just look a quick number look at his numbers put up 20 points you know, got a couple of rebounds, a couple of assists, a couple of steals. That's kind of a Marcus Simonovic night right now. Zvezda trusts him to make a lot of scores, either, you know, directly by actually just putting up points or finding ways to get guys involved. And essentially, he's like, well, the old man on the team, but not playing old man basketball. And that's kind of what they need. He's still playing like a reasonably young guy because, well, he's 30. He is a reasonably young guy. But relative to the rest of the starting lineup, he's the veteran. He's meant to be the organizing presence. And so... He's delivering what you expect from an athlete of his caliber at his age on the stat sheet, and that's what they really do need him to do to stay relevant. But he's also adding that element of leadership, veteran presence, all those, I hate intangibles, because there isn't anything that's truly intangible, but all those parts that are harder to measure from, with the naked eye. And it's well pretty much down to just him being smart. He knows what's necessary for Zvezda to win. He knows he's got to be a slightly different player for that to happen but not so much that it affects his, well, pure game. So he's finding really good balance in what he does. And I would say in terms of, you know, if you're going with most value in terms of value being what he does for a team, Sivanovic is right up there because he just brings that balance, brings that, I suppose, organization and discipline while also putting it up on the stat sheet. So Sivanovic, great performance last week as we expect from him and more of them likely to come. If you had to overlook one shot, would you swish it, wish it, or go fish it? And of course, we've got some really big games in the games of the week here. And uh, Aris, let's start off with your thoughts on Olympiakos hosting a little team called Fenerbahce. Uh, Fenerbahce is visiting Olympiakos. This means that Zeliko Bradovic is going to be back to Piraeus when, uh, where he's not going to get a lot of love. But Pero Antic and Kostas Lukas uh, will be honored by the Reds because of their parts uh, in... Uh, the back-to-back -back, uh, Euroleague winning Olympiacos team uh, that uh, may uh, get the spirits high in the stands and uh, also help uh, Fenerbahce avoid some of the booing at least early on but uh, this is gonna be uh, probably the most important showdown of uh, this uh, week why I'm saying that because the winner will stay in the second place and uh, the losing team will uh, take a step back uh, considering how close are uh, the teams in the Euroleague and uh, how difficult it's going to be the race not only for the playoffs but also for the home court advantage if Fenerbahce managed to get the road win then they will, will have made a huge huge step for getting to the top, for top four and of course that probably is the overall big game of the week but Moshe I suppose uh, what else have we got down here as like sort of you know the game people should really be watching? Well, my game of the week would be uh, the Maccabi, the Basconia Maccabi game simply for um, what it symbolizes most. I think uh, it could be a fresh beginning, or it could be a crash and burn for uh, Maccabi, which would be uh, probably catastrophic for the con uh, for the um, rest of the season. Uh, right now, they are struggling. They know it. Everyone knows it. But uh, Basconia has shown. Uh, uh, some aspects that might be uh, lacking for them. They are coming off a loss to Gran Canaria, uh, which happened not that long ago. And in game where, you know, Adam Hanga may be their best defensive stopper and I think maybe a candidate for the DPOY uh, in the EuroLeague, maybe. You know, he could be uh, the defensive player of the year. Uh, he's coming off a 30-minute game. They had a long flight afterwards back to, uh, uh, to Basconia. And, you know, it, it, it's a... Uh, it's a riddle for me, you know, to understand what are we expecting from this game. For me, as always, Adam Hanga ability on the defensive end would be a, um, 
would be very uh, uh, important for them. But I do think that you know this game could actually go either way. Even though that uh, Basconia's crowd is going to be there, um, you know, all up close and personal within Maccabi's faces, and for 40 minutes or more, um, this game would have ramifications to the rest of the season. I think for both teams, Basconia getting their shot of uh, uh, you know putting themselves uh, in a position to get the home court advantage, and Maccabi simply uh, you know uh, giving them another day to fight for a comeback. And I think that you know. Other games uh, are pretty obvious for me. I would go with, uh, uh, well, for me, I think Jalgiritz will beat uh, Milan. I think Madrid will beat uh, FS, Anadolu FS. Uh, I'm going with Easy Cheska over, um, uh, Easy Cheska over Ravenna Zvedza. I would like to hear your thoughts on the game uh, of um, uh, Barcelona and Darushafaka. Absolutely. Like, well, Dashka, we don't really know who they are still because. Just when you think they're, you know, world conquerors, they go and drop some pretty bad losses. Just when you think they're maybe not so great, they go and get some huge wins, including ones he covered earlier this show, in fact, and of course last week's episode, because they're sort of this strange team of, well, I suppose, runs especially. And so what David Bot's doing with them, we're still not entirely sure where they're going, what it's going to be. And this is an ideal game for them, like away to Barcelona to really test that out, because Barca are 6-8. and eight, And while in real terms there's not a huge between 6-8 and 7-8, at the turn for Barcelona, it's massive, like because a six and nine would be a funny record maybe to have going to second half of the regular season. But for Barcelona, it would be a terrible one as well. It would mean they have to win at least nine games realistically, probably ten of their subs of their subsequent fifteen if they're to make the playoffs. That's a huge, huge ask for them. Whereas right now, you go right, okay, let's see what we do here. We beat Dashka. We're seven and eight. We're basically five hundred, or as close as you can be in an odd number situation. That situation they can live with. It's one they can take. Dashka, of course, kind of go and they could have a bit of a bit of breathing room there over the six eight teams or what will be then six nine teams going into the turn. So a lot of sort of you know jostling for position and, and play. I'm leaning towards a home win here, but it could go either way purely because I don't know who Dashka are really yet. Sweet sixteen, an open look on Euro League basketball covering sixteen Euro League teams. Gonna be sweet, sweet sixteen. Well, we had a pleasure of you know uh, reading uh, on Eurohoops one of their trademarks about twenty sixteen. Uh, five greatest moments uh, basically for me it was I think maybe Nando becoming the first top scorer in the new EuroLeague era winning the uh, the title but you know what let's do our uh, final four magic uh, Aris what is your final four magic and you know why so believe it or not my first uh, final four as a fan was back in uh, 1994 at uh, Piraeus uh, when uh, Limoz won the cup against uh, uh, Tony Kukoc and uh, Benetton Treviso. Yes, it was that long. Uh, fortunately, I was still a uh, high school student then. Uh, in every basketball competition, it's a great experience, but uh, let's get to one of the best ever final fours of the modern age in EuroLeague, the one in 2009 in Berlin, where uh, Panathinaikos uh, got uh, the title. Uh, it was a strange final four for many reasons. Uh, Olympiakos was unlucky with Panagiotis Vasilopoulos uh, getting in, uh, back pains just before the start of the tournament and ultimately losing the prize. It was Panathinaikos who got the win with one of the best ever teams uh, assembled in the Euroleague history, which included not only Diamantidis but uh, Spanulis, Pekovic uh, and uh, Salonas Yasukevicius. Uh, but let's get uh, to what uh, journalists like and that's the press conference after the game, uh, the final and the press conference uh, Obradovic uh, was uh, uh, getting praise from anyone, even from a guy uh, from, uh, uh, I believe he was from uh, Skopje or something. Uh, so uh, I took the last question because I wanted to ask him something and because I have met him and he knew who I am, I, I believe that he could, he could give me a, an answer without feeling insulted. That kind of happened because I asked him uh, if he felt a little bit lucky because he won the title with twice his opponent losing the last shot. Uh, that's a causus belli for Obradovic. If you know him, you can't tell him that he's lucky, first of all, because he works like a dog. He works uh, more than uh, every other coach in uh, the Euroleague and also because that was an accusation made for him during the 90s mainly by the Greek uh, coaches in the Greek press that he was just lucky. Uh, he paused a little bit 
he asked me uh, he, he didn't uh, ask me anything he said if you consider what we have done today luck then uh, let's uh, continue to be lucky it was a great answer <laughs> he, he handled it pretty well uh, the problem was that after the, that he had to give uh, an interview to the live Greek television, uh, I feel partly responsible for his reaction on live television uh, and uh, I want to, to use this opportunity and uh, say to my colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Karmiris and of course uh, Rigas Dardalis, uh, that I, I apologize for uh, hitting things up with Obradovic before him going uh, out uh, in, on the court uh, to speak live. Where, where, where are the rings? No rings in your league, just uh, another thing. Just cups. Cups, yes. Just cups. Uh, you talked about uh, strange things uh, some minutes before in the press conference. What do you mean? You, be, you, believe, you believe that uh, this is good to be first question? Why? No, I ask you. You believe that after that we take title, you yes, keep because, something that I said in press yes, conference because about strange things. So, I, so I, I, thank I, you very uh, much. Next time I will no. give you opportunity to talk. Why? It's obviously a great story. I think 29, uh, you know, 2009 was a great, great Final Four. Emmett, what's your Final Four magic and why? Uh, well, I'm going to take it off the court a bit here because it was this year, actually it was this year, we are still in 2016, back in Berlin, and you know, you have a bit of, bit of a laugh at 504, so you're into people doing all sorts of random stuff, and occasionally you meet people who are lost, and so it was very early on the, uh, on the Sunday in fact, actually no correction, it was, it was the off day, it was a Saturday, and so I just finished playing the media game, that was a lot of fun as well, uh, mostly to see how bad I was at basketball, uh, but we just finished, and I was standing outside having a cigarette, and this young English bloke comes over to me, absolutely could not look more stressed. I mean, it was like something bad had happened. I was like, okay, mate, what's up? He goes, mate, I'm looking for a place called Arena. It's a club and I've got to be there. I need to be there reasonably early. I don't know why, because it was a nightclub, but you know, go with the story. And he goes, yeah, yeah, Grant, and you need to be there and whatever. And he goes, but I can't find it, I can't find it. And it's like, right, so they told you to come here because it's the Mercedes Benz Arena. He goes, yeah. He goes, right, well, there's a basketball thing on here, so I think it's the wrong spot. So. Whip out the phone, I first look, I go, you know, right, well, it's the far side of town, and, he go, and he's just looking panicked, because he knows nothing with the Berlin transit system, and I just go to him, yeah, you get a train from over there, like literally a, a three-minute three walk, and you're pretty much there in 20 minutes, and this look of joy, of glee, that this random smoker had come to his salvation was what I really needed that weekend. So, your man, as far as I can tell, we never saw each other again, he went out clubbing like a good young person, me, I went back and I kicked back and went for a few beers, a bit quieter. Man, that's a great story. Uh, uh, for me, I'm going with uh, 2014. That was the first time that, you know, you and I met, Emmett. That was our uh, first meeting uh, in Milan. And I had a, a couple of great stories from there. Um, so we'll st I'll start off with, um, you know, uh, journalists that were sitting next to me. I had uh, a couple of Ukrainian guys uh, from the Ukrainian media sitting next to me, um, you know, in the bleachers uh, um, at the, you know, at the Forum Diasagio. And then... They were cheering the entire time with, um, you know, they uh, had Maccabi's back as if they were fans. They went with Maccabi versus uh, Cheska. But when the, you know, when the final game started, that's where it got a bit more interesting. Because as it, as it turned out to be that they both were uh, fans, they loved uh, uh, Rudy Fernandez. So they were in a way feeling a bit ambivalent about who they're going with. So you, you, you had to see these two great guys, you know, going on... on going crazy on every basket Maccabi makes and then going even, even crazier with every uh, good move that, that, um, that uh, Fernandez made. So for them, it was a win-win. It didn't matter who won that game. It didn't matter who shined. They got their money worth. They got, you know, what uh, uh, they came for. And, you know, the other story was even more off the court, but very much court-related. Uh, it was just before the final game. You know, all the media came to the hotel with all the players. And I had a nice sit down with uh, uh, Sean James, who was then recovering from uh, a back surgery. Maccabi lost him uh, uh, just then, and you know we were interviewing him. So I said, "Listen, you know you are probably 40 minutes away from getting a title." There was this vibe in the air. You know, no one could explain it, but in a way, everyone knew that Maccabi are about to do something great over there. 
especially for the fact they made Madrid look bad for about 85 minutes during the season. Uh, um, it was it was epic. Well, not 85, 80 minutes because the overtime came in the finals game. So we said, yeah, well, you know, it, it's it's something that's possible that we we might be uh, uh, 40 minutes away from a title. So I told him, what? Um, so I asked him, you know, Sean, what are you gonna do if you're gonna win the the, the title? So he said. Well, you know, for me, if we win, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Sofo. I'm going to lift him up as if he was one of my uh, twin babies. And simply for that, you know, we shake him up in the air and hug him. And do I need to remind you guys, he's after back surgery. Needless to say, he did no such thing. So, uh, Sean, yeah, I'm expecting that still. Uh, simply for the, it, it's going to be one hell of a sight to see. So that is my Final Four story. Um, you know, hope you enjoy them. That's uh, our uh, uh, special thing for the holidays for you guys. Sweet 16. An open book on Euro League basketball. Covering 16 Euro League teams. Gonna be sweet. Sweet 16. So uh, that was our week's show, you know, with a surprise, a touch of a Final Four magic uh, from all of us uh, at Sweet 16. Wishing you guys a great week since every day is a Euro League day. You know, we would sign off as usual. You can find me at I am Team Scout and Moses B1 on Twitter. Obviously, the website TeamScout.net. And, you know, uh, Aris, where can they find you on Twitter and, you know, the other social media? You can find me, of course, on Eurohoops. You can find me in my personal Twitter, Arbarkas. Uh, uh, that's my handle. You can find me on Facebook using my name. And, of course, you can uh, watch me on television if you are a resident of uh, Greece or if you are... Uh, outside Greece and you are subscribers to Cosmote TV. And of course you can find me as ever on ballinEurope.com which looks a lot prettier than my bedroom does right now as well as at BIE underscore basketball uh, on Twitter and uh, Facebook.com slash ballinEurope. And I guess Moshe that's pretty much it for the show. Sure is and since every day is a EuroLeague day we would like to thank you for being with us on Sweet 16 and open look on EuroLeague basketball. And we would like to wish you again, happy holidays, guys. If there is anything you would like to ask, feel free. We're available on our social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter. Just feel free to ask. And, you know, just be with us. Follow us on uh, uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Till next time in the next episode of Sweet 16. Bye-bye.